So the nation's U.S. first peacetime draft happened in 1940. What's a draft? Uh, draft. So you're selected by the government. You have to register for the draft. So right now, even when these, uh, right now it's all the boys in this class. When they turn 18, they have to register for the draft. Maybe some, by the time you're 18, maybe the girls will have to do it too, I don't know. But right now it's just boys. The draft began with 18 year olds, but a boy can enlist at 17 if his parents signed the papers. One high school lad who wanted to be a fighter pilot ate so many carrots to sharpen his vision, he became temporarily orange. Uh, that's possible. 16 million men were drafted. 5 million others were rejected. Why would they reject you? So there is a criteria. Uh, some are turned away on account of emotional instability. Others were illiteracy. That means what? Couldn't read and write. Later, the Army inducted most of those cases and sent them to school until they reached the fourth grade level. By 1943, the draft had also lowered its physical standards to rock bottom. Anyone that was five feet tall and weighed 105 pounds would be accepted. Not everybody wanted to go to the draft, though, so they tried to evade the draft. The crown prince of draft evasion was a young man from Valley Station, Kentucky, who kept appearing at the draft board in various disguises to report on his rapidly deteriorating health. He came as a sister, a half-brother, a crippled old uncle, and finally dressed in a wig and a floppy hat as his mother. The mother reported that her son had died. 
but the deceased boy was drafted anyway. Mm -hmm. 43 Americans were officially classified as conscientious objectors. What's that mean? A conscientious objector. Uh, they didn't do it. What's your conscience? Come on, I know you know this. We went over. Tells you what's right and wrong. That tells you what's right and wrong. So a conscience objector is saying, I believe I can't do what? Fight. I can't kill somebody. So it goes against my conscience. So if you were drafted and were a conscience objector, what happened? You came a cook. You went to jail. Basically, if you're drafted and don't go, you go to jail. Eventually, though, some of those served as uh, non-combat roles. 6,000, however, went to federal prison. For a year or so after Pearl Harbor, about 1,000 servicemen a day got married because they wanted some type of tie back at home. Some between partners who had just met the night before, Private Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney's a famous uh, Hollywood actor that eventually got married and divorced about nine times. But this will probably tell you why. <coughs> he got married to a girl he met the night before and had a courtship of seven days. He said, I married Betty Jane because I was determined to marry somebody. Like Mickey Rooney and Betty Jane, the serviceman and his girl were looking for some sort of emotional anchor amid the uncertainties of the day. On the other hand, there were certain girls who were called allotment annies because they actually went out searching for a serviceman to get married because you got an allotment from the federal government as a wife of a serviceman, $50 a month. And then, if the person got killed, you got a $10,000 insurance policy. So a lot of them specialized in combat pilots because their life expectancy was so short. And some of them actually married more than one. In fact, the story goes, there it is. Um, two of them sipping beer, two uh, sailors sipping beer in an English pub got to comparing pictures of their wives and found out they were married to the same person. Military police broke up the fight. Everybody, everything the soldier received was marked GI. What's GI mean? You've heard of the GI Joe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's GI mean? Uh, Grass insurance. GI just stood for government issue. They learned the meaning of other, every other terms. What was the dining room called? Anybody? The mess hey, hall. What, what was food called? Did you start the video? Job. What was food called? I don't know, did I? Yeah, we did. Food is called chow. Oh, yeah. On the double means what? Fast food and double chip. Hurry up. Snafu. Hmm? You ever heard about a snafu? Mm -mm. Situation normal, all fouled up. Usually the F is a different word, though. <laughs> SOS. SOS was uh, for something they served at Mass Hall. Stood for something on a shingle, which is chip cream beef on toast. The something it also sometimes it was a different word they used for something. If you were African American. You were in segregated groups. So segregation continued into World War II. 
The GI is a pack animal. The soldier at the front was not much like the slicked up actors on TV. It was dehumanizing and degrading. He became more or less a beast of burden, carrying an average daily load of 84 pounds. In addition to his essential equipment, which was a helmet, a helmet liner, M1 rifle and carbon, bayonet, knife, and a canteen, he had a web full of cartridges and hand grenades, an entrenching tool, and a first aid pouch. On his back was a poncho, a mess kit, and sea rations. What are sea rations? Uh, seaweed. Seafood. No, it's C rations like this, a C. That means if you couldn't cook your food, it was just a freeze dried up stuff that you had to try to eat. More than anything else, a GI needed socks. He was in constant need of clean, dry socks, especially in the Pacific theater, which we're, we'll uh, talk about the difference. Today though, we, because in the Pacific theater, it's a lot different than the European theater. They don't know the geography of it, okay? As much as 16 inches of rain might fall in a single day. When the rain stopped and the sun appeared, suffocating waves of steam rose. Crocodiles and pythons lurked in the sloughs and the bayous. At night, the GI had to tear leeches from his private parts. Little light appeared through the, dick, the thick matted vines overhead and the vines swarmed with fleas and chiggers and biting ants and poisoned spiders. When scratched, bug bites turned into festering sores. Waving away swarms of flies was called the New Guinea salute. Hardly a GI escaped jungle rot, which were hideous ulcers that were formed on your feet, arms, and bellies. Many suffered from uh, various fevers, berry, berry, malaria, hook worm. Most GIs ran a fever a great deal of the time. The rule was you couldn't go to the hospital unless your temperature was over 100 degrees. The GIs in the Pacific called themselves jungle bunnies because it had to do with part of their, their uh, strategy for fighting. So today we want to look at the home front. What was it like for the people back? Who wants to be my clicker? Who hasn't been my clicker that wants to be the clicker? Um, hasn't been this year or this time? This, this year. You have it? Okay. So he started off, we were neutral, but then we, we know we needed, so lend lease was passed, which said we're going to lend and lease military goods to who? England. England. Defense. Great. I meant to England, but officially it was to who? Anyone considered uh, important. Uh, important. Yeah. Yeah. important to our defense. What's an embargo? People that are falling asleep, anybody should put you in the front row so I can wake you up like this. Can I help you? Ben. Okay. So we weren't training with Japan. Next slide. Next. So this shows the election 18, 1940. Who won? FDR. Okay, in a landslide. That's why you probably never heard of Wendell Wilkie. You never hear of the people that lost unless they what? A lot of presidents lose and then they what? Get mad. No. They run again. They run again and win later on. Next. 
So there was a group of people that didn't want us to be in the war and thought even Lend Lease was bad. Those people are called what? What's the term for that? Again, that was our foreign policy for most of our history. What's it called? Isolationists. Okay, so they were isolationists. There's a famous Minnesotan that did that. It says it right there. Who is it? Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, who we lived for a while. You know where he lived? Minneapolis. Up in Little Falls. Yep. You can see his house. They have a museum up there. Dissolve four days after Pearl Harbor. Why would it dissolve? So there's nobody going to say we need to be isolationists anymore. Next slide. Wilson, our uh, FDR did the four freedoms. Who knows what the four freedoms are? Right, speech, bear arms. Close. Next one. So we have freedom of speech. Okay. Freedom to worship. Freedom from want. What's that mean? It means economic understandings, which will secure to every nation. Put it in your own words. What's that mean? He can want something. Everybody should have enough to survive on, to live on. And the fourth is freedom from fear. Next, again, fighting Hitler. Talked about this. Next. Next. So we know what Pearl Harbor happened. So 2,400 Americans killed. We were lucky because there were some battle, there were some ships that weren't in the harbor at the time. If the ships were in the harbor at the time, our Navy could have been totally crippled. Okay, but there had been some that were out on maneuvers. The most infamous, of course, is the Arizona. There, there's a anybody been to Pearl Harbor? Did you go aboard the Arizona? Okay. Next. So they knew of an attack but didn't know. It was a sneak attack because it happened when? What was so surprising? Oh, well, 8 o'clock in the morning, right? It was morning and what else? Sunday. It was a Sunday morning. Instead of all the people being in church, guess where they were? Um, they're in bed sleeping so it caught them even worse by surprise many of them next his most famous speech they got a copy of it here next one so here's he actually crossed off the words a day which will live in infamy, infamy. he changed that so you see it was supposed to say a day which will live in world history so it was one of the most famous speeches in history. And he made a lot of the changes himself. Next. This is some of the unusual facts. They actually had four German agents that landed in New York. That they caught a couple of them. So the first German spies that came into the US. They caught some because they actually had their they were changing from their scuba stuff, and so they, they caught him on the shore. Next. So on the U-boats, they had to face those. They were outside even our coast, right along the coast of New York. Next. This was another unusual fact. So the Pearl Harbor, there was no actual bombing raid on the US, except the Japanese did these. They had these inflatable balloons that had incendiary bombs. What are incendiary bombs? Fires. So they were supposed to start fires in the forests along the west coast. One actually made it all the way in. Here it is. Uh, this one. That's the only casualties within our country that happened from one of these. One actually made it all the way into Kansas. 
that didn't do any damage there, I don't think. Next. The Civil Defense Administration came out. Again, everybody's afraid that they're attacking Pearl Harbor, they're going to do what? They're going to come in and, and invade the U.S. So it was a great fear. That's why, since the Japan, Japanese did it, our treatment of the Japanese in our country in World War II was terrible. People, uh, barber shops put out Japs shaved, not responsible for accidents. Or they just wouldn't sell at all to anybody that was Japanese. There are two types. You have the Nisei and the Issei, which are the first generation Japanese. That means they were born in Japan. And then you had all these American uh, born Japanese. And we're going to find out what happened to them. Did you read that part yet? And mm -hmm. um, yeah. <clears throat> we call them internment camps, but basically they were just in a concentration camp. Concentration camp is just a, a concentration of people you're, you're holding prison. And that's what we did to the Japanese. Although well, the conditions were a lot better than the ones in Germany, but that's still what we did to the Japanese. So basically they did issued it. Maybe it's going to come up here. Let's go on here. Next one. So again, the, the president has all kinds of powers once the war. So a lot of the freedoms we would normally have, what happens to them? Get free, right? Yeah, you don't have those freedoms anymore. The government can take them away. So if I were to talk in World War II, and I would be anti-government, I could risk being what? Killed. Not killed, yeah. but put in jail. Okay. So they took control of businesses, censorship. Okay. So if you mailed letters, they're going to open your mail. Next. Next. So we talked. So besides the ones that were drafted, thousands enlisted. Okay. Next. Show them calisthenics next. He became the chief of staff. Uh, again, a lot of money put out. We're going to hear his name later on after the war, who starts the Marshall Plan as Secretary of State. Next. The biggest change were for women, just like in World War I, but even more so, because so many more went to World War II men. Next. So you have the WAX, who the Woman's Army Air, okay, Army Corps. They were called WAX. Next. You have the Waves, who were for the Navy. Next. You have the WASPs, who were the Air Force. Next. Again, here you see the women working in the factories. Just last year, the poster child of propaganda for this was called the, the girl that's uh, flexing her arm. How many have seen that poster? Maybe it's going to come up. In mm -hmm. She was called Rosie the Riveter. The person that posed for that just died last year. I think it was in the paper. Next. There she is. Okay. Next. What's the job of war information? Just like Spot. the Committee of Public Ed Information in World War One, this this their job is to do what? To make people want to join. Yeah. What's that mean? Sell it, right? Sell the war. You gotta sell it. Next. So here's some propaganda posters. Next. Even Disney cartoons. We're going to, uh, what I show that? There's a video that shows uh, Bugs Bunny getting people to buy war bonds. Next. 
movies were all about making the Nazis criminals, making the Japanese look bad. All of the Germans and Japanese were all spies. Again, they're, they're trying to sell the war. Next. You as people, what we had to do is ration. That means what? What's ration mean? What? Well, you couldn't go to the store and buy whatever you wanted. You got a book every month of ration stamps. And these ration stamps determine what you could buy. And one of the worst things, or most difficult things, was gasoline. So you got a letter, A, B, C, D, E. If you were E, that's for emergency. You get as much gasoline as you want. If you're A, you get like one gallon a week. That means you were low priority. So I couldn't teach her at St. Joe's if during World War II, because I lived 30 miles away. I'd have to board around in one of your homes. Next. Changing over our thing to wartime production. Next. We had ships, turned out lots of ships. They were called Liberty ships. So every day three are entering. That's how they fast they made them. Next. Big airplane factory that uh, Henry Ford made. Basically, uh, it was like a, a whole community of villages. He, he made houses for all the people. You went there to live, and you worked there around the clock, making 14 uh, airplanes a day. Next. Next. Again, this is part of the rationing. They did scrap drives. Next. This was, again, rubber drives. So they, at the, at the uh, gas stations, Boy Scouts would collect your mats inside your cars because they were made out of rubber. Next. Again, selling that, getting. Next. So a lot of cars lost their bumpers or gave up their bumpers for, for scrap iron. Again, this is changing the wartime production over. Next. This came after the war. Next. Let's skip some of this. Let's go to the short video here on the home front. You want to turn that other light off? Right? And keeps us segregated? For many, the answer was yes. 
and they joined the fight. About one million African Americans served in segregated units in non-combat roles until 1943. After 1943, African Americans were put into active service in the war. One of the most famous African American groups during the war was the Tuskegee Airmen. Tuskegee Airmen was an all-black fighter squadron that fought in the European theater. This group was very important because they proved that African Americans could serve their country as well as white. Asian Americans also served the United States military. Despite distrust of them, after Pearl Harbor, thousands served in combat and as spies. In fact, the 4th and 42nd Regiment was made up of first and second generation Asian Americans. This was one of the most decorated combat groups of World War II. These soldiers fought in Germany and were made up primarily of Nisei, or first generation Japanese Americans. Additionally, over 300,000 Mexican Americans served in the war. Native Americans also bravely served their country. They played a huge role in the Pacific theater. In particular, the Navajo served as code talkers on the battlefield. Using their rare Navajo language as a code, they proved to be a vital resource for the United States on the battlefield. We were able to send secure information, which helped us to protect our fleet. By early 1942, factories were converted from consumer goods to wartime goods. In order to ensure the efficient production of wartime goods, the government took control of the economy. The Office of Price Administration, or the OPA, froze prices on expensive, needed war goods. Cheaper goods meant the military could buy more of them from private firms, and thus make sure the military was fully stocked for the war effort. The Office of Price Administration fixed prices to a low level on goods like oil, rubber, and aluminum, all goods that the military needed to win the war. Another government agency created during the war was the War Productions Board, WPB. The War Productions Board held scrap drives to recycle needed materials and allocate inputs to the war effort. The main goal of the War Productions Board was to reduce waste of needed materials for the war effort. Another government agency during the war was the National War Labor Board, or the NWLB. The National War Labor Board limited wages to keep cost of productions low and keep workers on the job. The board helped to foster cooperation between businesses and workers during the war effort to keep factories open and keep goods being made. The government also helped put into place a rationing system during the war. Consumers were given coupon books. With the limited number of tickets, consumers had to buy goods with these tickets, and it helped pace consumption. It ensured goods would not run out, and whatever was needed by the military would be sent to them in plentiful numbers. During the war, the American working class changed significantly and benefited greatly. Unemployment dropped to 1.2% by 1944, and wages increased by 10%. Good weather, improved machinery, and high demand increased farmers' profits, and they were able to pay off loans from the Great Depression. Women began to take a larger role in the workforce, making up 35% of it. They were able to get more pay, and they broke the mold of what a typical woman was supposed to be. This is where we see the iconic image of Rosie the River Group. It cannot be emphasized too much on how big of a role women played in the factories making war goods for the men fighting abroad. Americans who were hit financially by the Great Depression also got the opportunity to invest their money. Americans saved their money buying war bonds. Here is how war bonds work. The American public would take their money and invest it with the United States government in war bonds. The government would issue the bond to the consumer in return for their money. Following their money, the government would then pay war industries in order to make war materials for the military, like guns, tanks, ships, planes, and other supplies. These supplies would then reach the men who needed it overseas, the armed forces. Once the war was won, due to the large part of the American public donating their money, the U.S. government would pay them back, plus interest. Despite wartime advancements, minorities faced both prejudices both at home and in the military. African Americans lived in segregated cities, got lower pay, and faced violence. James Farmer formed CORE, or the Congress on Racial Equality, to fight segregation. Like the NAACP, CORE became a leading group in the civil rights movement. Another leader of this movement was A. Philip Randolph, and he formed a black labor union to fight workplace inequality. Despite the need for labor during the war, African Americans were still hired last. He felt it was unfair and wanted to make change. Mexican Americans also faced prejudice during the war. When an American sailor was attacked by a perceived Mexican American wearing what is called a zoot suit, which is known as a long suit, which uses an excess of fabric. Sailors became outraged by the attack, and this set off what is known as the Zoot Suit Riots. Sailors would attack Hispanic youths wearing these Zoot Suits. They were beaten in the streets, and all this was based on racial profiling. Because of this racial profiling in Los Angeles, it is now still on the books not legal to wear a Zoot Suit in the county of Los Angeles. After the attacks on Pearl Harbor, anti-Japanese paranoia ran rampant in the United States. Fear that Japanese Americans would help the enemy attack from within was real. And because of this, Japanese Americans along the West Coast suffered discrimination. On February 12, 1942, without any probable cause, Franklin Roosevelt issued the Executive Order 9066. The military established militarized zones along the West Coast. 
Japanese Americans were forced to leave their homes at the point of a gun and move to these closed camps. Within weeks, 110,000 Japanese Americans from California, Oregon, Arizona, and Washington were moved to internment camps. Two thirds of them were Nisei, or first generation Japanese Americans. They were only able to bring what they could carry, and many lost their homes and their businesses. For those Japanese Americans who didn't lose their home, when they returned from the camps, they found the homes ransacked, trashed, and vandalized. In 1944, the Supreme Court heard a case, Korematsu versus the United States. Fred Korematsu was a Japanese American who was interred with his family during the war. He challenged the constitutionality of Japanese internment and the violation of his civil rights. However, in their decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the forced relocation of Japanese Americans was justified on the basis of military necessity or national security. The Supreme Court essentially stated that based on the evidence provided at the time, the United States and government interred Japanese Americans to protect the war effort from potential espionage and sabotage. After the war, Japanese Americans formed the Japanese American Citizens League, or JACL. This group fought after the war for compensation for the injustices to Japanese Americans during the war. In 1965, the United States Congress agreed to compensation, but less than 10% of Japanese American victims were compensated for the losses during the war. In 1990, the United States Congress promised $20,000 to any victims, and President Bush apologized formally on behalf of the United States government. With American soldiers struggling on the battlefield, Americans at home were struggling as well. Minorities and women were fighting for the acceptance that they deserved as contributing members of society. And the United States We're government was trying its best to dig the American economy out of a depression and help to fuel the war thousands of miles away. So that's the home front. What about the military front? We said yesterday there were how many fronts? Not yesterday, but last time. For the U.S., how many fronts? Militarily. So we got the war in Europe, and we have the war where? Okay. Of course, the public wanted wanted to uh, put all our efforts where Pacific. the Pacific, because Japan's the one that bombed us. But Hitler was considered to be a bigger threat. So then it it came down to where do you attack? Okay. And that's what our next movie that we'll see next time we'll talk about. But there was a debate. Russia was taking the brunt of the war because they're trying to defend these cities right here. Okay? They wanted to have a front established over here. Great Britain didn't trust the Soviet Union. Okay, so they wanted to attack through here because they knew or felt that whatever Russia liberated when the war was over was going to become what? Nothing. Communist, like they are. Because that's what communism stands for. So they had to compromise. Where are they going to attack? And so what the first European theater became known as Operation Torch. Guess where they're attacking? Was this in the reading? This is where they attack. North Africa. The person in charge of it all, who became known as General of the Armies, is General Dwight Eisenhower. He's in charge of all the troops. The British general. So on the one movie we saw the Germans had pushed them all the way back here to Egypt. Okay? The British general was Bernard Montgomery. And they were gonna fight who? They were gonna fight a guy known as the Desert Fox. 
Who's that? Erwin Rommel. Who's the German general? Why do they call him the Desert Fox? Foxes are known for what? Being sneaky and crafty. And that's what he was known for. So they dominated North Africa. They were pushing here. So the Operation Torch was okay. We're going to land. Eisenhower's going to land Allied troops here. Montgomery's going to launch an offensive here. And they were going to come and push, push Rommel out of North Africa. That was the plan. And of course, the plan worked after much death and fighting. And again, then after this works, they got to decide what? Where do you attack next? What does Russia want? A front in Europe. They want a front over here. Britain wants a, to establish a front here. Again, the thing that the Soviet Union doesn't have, which would have made it much more powerful nation, is a warm water port. All the ports for Russia or the Soviet Union are frozen part of the year round. So they were afraid that if Russia or Soviet Union got control of this, they would become a much more powerful nation that they'd have to deal with after the war. So you notice there it wasn't just about fighting the enemy, it's also that your ally you don't trust. Because they have different ideologies. Communism is way different than democracy. So they settle here to invade through what they call the soft underbelly of Europe, which is what? Italy. Italy is the soft underbelly. So they invade up through Italy in 1943. All the time that this is going on, they are planning to establish a front over here. And that is called Operation Overlord. Operation Overlord was the invasion here of France to establish a front there. And that day which is coming up, the celebration of it, June 6th, okay? It's called D-Day, and we'll talk about that more next time. We have, you need to finish reading the chapter. I have a section four worksheet. Mm -hmm. Lily? Uh, what was the operation overload? That was the code name. Again, all these have different code names because they're trying to keep it secret for the invasion of France across these beaches of Normandy. So write that down in your planners. Read 8, 15 to 18, 8, 19. Read 15 to 8, 19. Do this. So you can do a few now. When I get back, I gotta run down. And then uh, we can go outside. Okay, what are we reading to? 815 to 819. Yeah. Oh, Bella, what is it? Oh, Thank you.
Oh god, what was that eye? He has some scary eyes. Oh, I forgot this is going on YouTube. What's up, YouTube? This is our homework. Guys, go this is subscribe vlog, guys. to my channel. Um, cool kiddo123. I'm just kidding. I don't actually vlog. Oh, crap. Crap, crap, crap. Her. Hold on. <laughs> what is that? That's like a. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, why do I look so. How many ads does he have? He has too many ads. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I'm trying to click on all these ads. Okay. She. Oh, this is the wrong one. She got it. Mama always told me I was different. I got no fear. Sorry, I had that sound in my head. Oh, it's the study thing. Oh. I'm sorry, JK, if you watch this. Everyone was sleeping in this class. I know, literally everybody was Okay, guys, we're going outside. Yup, bye, Chase. Can I stop the video? Mr. Hill, can I stop the video? Yeah. Alright, bye. Best day.